on here. I 
good evening. Uh, my name's Don Matthews. I'm the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology here at the Larner College of Medicine. I have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker. I want to welcome you all to the second lecture of this season's Community Medical School, and I hope you uh, find this time well spent. Just a few housekeeping things. Uh, I would encourage you to fill out the evaluation form that you received coming into the, to the room. It's very helpful as we put these programs together, uh, if you'd hand them in to the uh, people at the, at the door on the way out. There will be a significant time for questions and answers at the end of the session, and I'd ask that you um, wait for a microphone to be delivered to you before you ask your questions so it can be uh, heard by everyone and appropriately archived on the video that's being made of this event. And I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. James Wolfe, uh, who is an assistant professor of anesthesiology here at the Larner College of Medicine. He's a board certified anesthesiologist and a pain medicine specialist at the University of Vermont Health Network. He's currently the medical director at the Champlain Valley Physician Hospital Interventional Pain Service in Plattsburgh, New York. And he also serves as the Interventional Pain Rotation Director at the UVM Medical Center Comprehensive Pain Program in South Burlington. Dr. Wolf received his medical degree from the State University of New York Downstate College of Medicine, as well as completing an anesthesiology residency and a pain medicine fellowship here at the University of Vermont uh, Medical Center. He's currently investigating the feasibility of using sphenopalatine ganglion blocks to treat post-epidural puncture headaches. He teaches in our medical school bridge curriculum, and he's most recently led a case-based learning discussion about opioids and chronic pain management. James's lecture tonight is entitled Opioids, Cannabis, and Chronic Pain, What Doctors Do and Don't Know, and I welcome you, Dr. Welcome, James. So just an outline of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about a the pharmacology and um, biochemistry of opioids as a medication class a little bit. I'm going to get into the neurology of chronic pain um, and some of the pathways that we investigate when we're thinking about chronic pain. And then I'm going to move over to kind of the epidemiology of what we call the opioid crisis and kind of how it started. And where things are going with it, um, what I think is important about improving things in that domain. And, you know, when we think about opioids and how we used to use them for patients and how things have come about, um, you know, the medical establishment really has um, ideas at one point in terms of how to take care of people that can change a lot over time. So as I go through some of these topics, I hope that you'll get an idea of kind of how we evaluate what a good or bad therapy is and how we counsel people on how we think they ought to direct their treatment. I'm also going to talk a little bit about cannabis. This is a picture of Uncle David. He's not really my uncle. We just call him that. but. Um, I really like him. He's a good friend. He's lived quite a life. He uh, dropped out of dental school in the 60s and joined this like free love commune, which he got kicked out of because apparently he was like too free with the free love. I don't know the details behind it, and that's fine. But um, then he disappeared for like 10 years, and when he came back, we found out he had been in Japan becoming like a master tofu maker, which is like a really difficult achievement to accomplish in Japan, because he doesn't speak any Japanese at all. And um, he started like a really famous natural foods co-op, and he uses a lot of cannabis. Some of his favorite one-liners are, he talks like Tommy Chong, if anybody remembers who that is, and he goes like, 
how come when you're a kid you have to hide your pot from your parents and when you're a parent you have to hide your pot from your kids man and um I, I just want to tell you one other story i was at his house at his he's kind of like lives on this acreage overlooking the mountains and it's really beautiful and my friend was getting married there and i was like uncle david this is just a beautiful place for a wedding and he was like yeah man i've gotten married here a bunch of times every one of them has been like so great um, and so, you know, he'll always tell me about it, it, cannabis and all the things that it's great for. And one time I was like, do you have these problems? Or like, do you know people with all of these issues? And he's like, no, I just like it. So I said um, something like, well, maybe you would have had them, but you use cannabis so much that you just like never got them. He was like, that's it, man. Um, but the first time I met him, I was like trying to go to medical school. I think I was t like struggling through physics one. And I met him for about like two minutes. And he's like, so medically, what about marijuana? And that started off pretty much a similar experience that I, and I'm sure a lot of other doctors and healthcare professionals have had at a lot of Thanksgivings and a lot of barbecues where somebody will find you and kind of back you into a corner and be like, what about marijuana? And I think, you know, this kind of gets back to what I was saying about opioids. For I think what Uncle David was telling me and what other people are telling me is like, you called me a pothead for decades and the medical establishment did and society did, and now you're finding that there's actually some applications for this stuff. So, you know, do you know what you're talking about or not? And I'm going to talk through some studies and some literature that I think explain some things about what we know and explain why we kind of don't know as much as we'd like. So that's my goals and objectives, a better Thanksgiving and barbecues and so on for doctors. So if I teach a few of you enough about cannabis so that if you see like a doctor or nurse getting lambasted by somebody like Uncle David at a party this season, you can step in and say, I actually know something about this and take over for them. Yeah. So I see people of a variety of different ages out here and it, looking at and judging some people's ages, I wonder if there's some people who might be taking some biochemistry or pharmacology courses right now. And there might be some of you who have a very, very limited understanding of kind of pharmacology and biochemistry. I'm going to give the most basic explanation for the mechanism of opioids at the cellular level that I can. Um, what we're taught in biology and biochemistry is you have these nerves that come from the from the outside of the body, from the skin, in this case, your thumb, and they go up to your spinal cord where they have a relay called a synapse with a nerve that goes up to your brain. So these little tiny parts out here closest to the skin are called the nociceptors, those little kind of nerve endings. And they're really good at telling whether tissue around them has been cut or burned or smashed or in some way injured. And when they figure that out, they send the signal up to the spinal cord. And at this end of the nerve up here in the spinal cord, it'll squirt out some neurotransmitters, some chemicals that can signal to the other cell. And that'll activate that blue nerve so that the signal can get to the brain and the brain can decide that maybe you ought to move your hand or your thumb or do something to kind of protect yourself or get out of that situation. Now, certain molecules like morphine and other kinds of opioids and endorphins, which are basically versions of opioids that our body makes ourselves, uh, up here at the spinal cord end of the nerve uh, can interact with these receptors here, where it says opioid receptor. Receptor is like a fancy name for receiver because it receives a specific molecule that signals it to do stuff. And in this case, this receptor, when that morphine connects to it, changes its shape. 
and it changes its shape in such a way that a little piece of it breaks off. I'm going to kind of increase the size here so we can look at this a little more closely. And that little piece is kind of actually a chemical signal in its own right. It goes over to an enzyme called adenylate cyclase. That's why it's called AC. And it basically turns it off. It kind of jams itself in there and gums up the works. Now, when that enzyme is doing what it ought to do, it's going around doing stuff like keeping this green little door here that says CA2+, that stands for calcium. It's keeping that open so a nice amount of calcium can come into the cell. When the calcium is in the cell and it's around this bottom piece of machinery here that says neurotransmitter release, the calcium will allow that nerve to squirt out its neurotransmitter onto that blue nerve that we looked at so the signal can get up to the brain. But when the morphine attaches to that receptor, changes its shape, breaks off the little piece that inhibits that enzyme, that door to calcium is shut, won't open, or won't open quickly or often enough, and there's not a lot of calcium inside the cell. And so that piece of cellular machinery that releases the neurotransmitter doesn't do that. So the signal coming up from the thumb that got hit by the hammer is kind of decreased. It's not getting there as strongly. Now, depending on the cellular setup of that nerve and kind of the different types of um, machinery that's configured within it, those opioids can also, and other medicines for that matter, can have opposite effects. For example, here, what we're seeing is where it says neurotransmitter at number one, that could be an opioid or some other medicine. It attaches to its receptor. It changes its shape. It makes a little piece pop off, the one that says alpha there. And in this case, that little piece actually turns on adenylate cyclase. It turns on that enzyme and starts it making these molecules called CAMP that activate and turn another enzyme, protein kinase A, that sticks phosphate groups on stuff. That's what that P is. And in this case, it stuck it on a potassium channel. And when it's stuck onto that potassium channel, it closed that potassium channel, and now potassium can't get out of the cell. Potassium's supposed to kind of flow out of the cell at a regular rate, and now it's not doing that so much. So the potassium is building up and building up and building up inside the cell, and potassium is like a positive charge. That's why there's like a little picture of a voltmeter there. So as the inside of the cell gets more and more and more and more positive, it might be more likely to pop off and send a signal up to the brain. So depending on how the cell is set up, it might inhibit a transmission of a single or, or signal, or it might kind of amplify it. So in talking about chronic pain, it's good to think about what happens if you do hit your thumb with a hammer or cut it or something. You know that the area around it gets really painful. You don't want to move it or use it. And that's probably a good thing because you do, you know, break your thumb or something, you don't want to be video gaming with it or you want to give it a break. Well, not a break because I just said you broke it. Like, <laughs> you want to give it a rest. Um, and the reason that that happens is when you do damage some tissue, the cells release all these, these little sprinkles here are representing more transmitters. But in this case, I'm going to call them inflammatory transmitters. And they're working on these little, these squiggly line things and stuff are receptors in their own right. And they're making that nerve more likely to send a signal up to the brain that something is hurt. And when we think about, here's a little idea of kind of where all this stuff is happening. We're out here kind of at the ending of the nerve right now. Now sometimes what we think happen is even after that thumb heals up, those cells here 
continue to release those inflammatory chemicals. And they keep sensitizing that nerve. And sometimes it even looks like those cells have stopped releasing that inflammatory material and you can't really measure it anymore. But nevertheless, the nerve seems to be still sensitized and hasn't really gone back to normal to transmit in an appropriate way. It's still transmitting in this like dysregulated way. To add to that, this, this nerve here that's going up to the brain, that one can also get sensitized. And that one we call central sensitization because now we're in the spinal cord, which is the central nervous system. So one of the ways that happens is when that peripheral nerve, that nerve that goes to the skin, keeps firing and firing and firing and firing. And it keeps telling the nerve that it's talking to, danger, danger, tissue damage. We're in trouble out here. It seems like that uh, nerve that goes to the brain gets really, really primed to send more signals of pain. And it's not just the increase in the firing of the lower nerve that does that. Also, things like opioids and certain emotional states like anxiety seem to prime those nerves too. And here's kind of an example of that. You've got this nerve that goes to a pain pathway. And there's some yellow triangles there. One looks like a fire. One looks like a chicken. And one, I don't know what the other one is. Kind of like an army tank. I don't think that's what they are. But I can't figure out what they are. But I know what they're trying to represent is like something that's damaging tissue. So underneath that, you have this other nerve that its job is just to transmit basically signals of touch. So like a feather, nothing that hurts. But there's also a little bit of crosstalk, as you can see here, between the nerve that will respond to regular old touch and the nerve that responds to tissue damage and pain. And it seems like if you keep activating that pain nerve over and over and over again, the connections up top where that crosstalk happens get kind of confused and they get overactive and they don't really work in the appropriate way. So all of a sudden that nerve that transmits regular touch like just from a feather is taking kind of a wrong turn and going up the pain pathway and things like opioids and the chemical state that's induced by anxiety and depression kind of create some biochemical confusion there that seem to um, basically confuse whether your brain's getting a signal from just regular touch or something that's actually tissue damage and it all gets interpreted as pain. So we think those are some of the some of the mechanisms behind why people get painful conditions that even though it looks like they should be healed are still causing a lot of the symptoms. I should mention though that there are some kind of painful conditions where, uh, and I was trying to think of an example of this and the best one I could think of was if you've ever met anybody who said, I need a knee replacement, my knee's bone on bone. Anyone ever heard that? Okay, so what they're telling you, what their doctor told them is when they looked at some imaging of their knee, all the cartilage is off the knee and there's no nice um, shock absorption between the two bones of the leg at the knee. And every time they walk, their knees are banging into each other and it hurts. And that's a chronic pain condition, not really because of this, but because they have an anatomical problem there that either needs to get fixed or can't get fixed. Then you might have somebody who, let's say, had to have an amputation of a limb. And they got their limb amputated, and for all the world, it looks like they're doing okay. You see them back in the office, and that surgical site is healed, and there's a scar there, of course, and, but it's clean. There's no infection there. You can get imaging of it. 
and everything's kind of in the right place and the way it's supposed to be. But that patient will tell you that that site is incredibly painful and they can barely touch it. And you know, if you were a really insensitive doctor, you'd be like, why, it looks fine. But we know that it's um, probably because of some of these mechanisms here at the nerve itself, even though all the ways that we can measure that by examining it and imaging it aren't really going to show anything. I also just wanted to quickly note, um, I think probably this is the best slide to point it out. We talked about peripheral sensitization and central sensitization. And as long as we're talking about opioids, we ought to talk about tolerance. So if you know anything about opioids, you know that for a lot of folks, if you have some kind of long-standing pain that's not you know, going to get better anytime soon. If you took an opioid for eight weeks or so, it might make that pain somewhat better. But then, after a period of time, you'll see this dose of morphine or whatever I'm taking isn't like cutting the mustard. It's not making any, it's, it seems to be much less effective. And the injury or the pain complaint hasn't gotten worse but the medicine's less effective. And the reason that probably that happens is that as we put more opioids and morphine around the cells, that opioid receptor, that proliferates. So instead of one blue opioid receptor being there, it'll be, they'll be popping up all over the place. There'll be twice as many. So in order to make that chain reaction happen that I talked about before, you need that many more opioid or morphine molecules around the nerve to get the same effect. And so you can put more around there to get the same effect. But once again, those receptors will continue to proliferate. And we can see that on histology. So that's a, a different thing, but somewhat related. So I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about um, the epidemiology of opioid misuse and overdose, and um, most of that information I have from the CDC. And their information kind of lags where we are in real life a little bit because they have to kind of gather it from all their sources. But I think it's, um, it's pretty rigorously gathered, and it's, it's pretty accurate. And uh, I think it actually sheds a lot of light on kind of what's going on right now. Anybody who's paid attention to um, opioids and opioid overdose deaths in the news probably understands this graph, at least conceptually. So the purple line is um, deaths by prescription opioid overdoses kind of climbing here. And what happened was, and some people probably know this, and, and um, have lived through it, and some people might have kind of read books about it and stuff, but the kind of a simplistic explanation is that back in the 90s, the Joint Commission for Hospital Accreditation and some other entities wanted doctors to really aggressively treat pain, and they said things like pain should be zero in patients at all times. And the problem was they had kind of some ethically questionable financial crossovers with the drug companies that were making the medicines that were supposed to get people to a zero out of 10 pain at all times. I say zero out of 10 because a lot of times when we say, and it actually developed from this clinical scenario, the idea of saying, well, what's your pain? Zero is no pain, 10 is 10 pain at all. It's kind of a common question that we ask clinically. Um, the other thing was the, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies that were uh, marketing these medicines had extremely aggressive marketing practices. And they were so aggressive that in 2007, I think it was, um, they were actually deemed illegal. And three of the executives from Purdue Pharma uh, were convicted, I think, of criminal charges. They got 400 hours of community service, I think, and um, probation. And this was... Um, even back in 2007, uh, a very public and 
very controversy on talked about trial. The county seat where it was tried had a lot of demonstrations, uh, family and patient advocacy groups there. And a lot of the popular thinking at the time was that these three people who didn't go to jail, but a lot of people thought they should go to jail, were kind of like no different than street level drug dealers. And the only reason they didn't get a worse punishment was because they were, you know, white guys in suits. And people were really angry about, you know, um, kind of how they marketed their products and how they felt they were responsible. So around that time, at least around 2010, the um, medical establishment starts kind of realizing that they've probably discounted some of the dangers behind prescription opioids and um, a lot of the like pill mills and people who were just exchanging prescriptions for cash started to be regulated and they started to be shut down. So you started to see a curtailing of kind of the supply of opioid pills that was around. And notice that as soon as this flattens out, you can't see my mouth. So as soon as the purple line starts to flatten out, that's when the spike of heroin overdose deaths begin. And that's because during this whole time that the um, purple line is increasing and people are dying from opioid overdose deaths, people are still getting more and more and more addicted. And so if the supply is curtailed, they really had nothing to do except kind of follow simple economics, which is where else can I get the substance that I'm now addicted to, um, which is heroin, because heroin does the same thing as the opioids that you get in a prescription, right? And um, it's you know basically cheaper, and you don't have to go through a doctor or an insurance company. Then, because heroin became popular, there be there was a lot of competition between street level heroin dealers, and if you're a heroin dealer on the street and you like hot pack your heroin with fentanyl and you can get your customer like a lot higher, a lot quicker, they're gonna like go back to you. So um, it became advantageous to the street level dealers to put heroin in their fentanyl, but fent uh, fentanyl in their heroin. But fentanyl is really, really potent. It's really, really dangerous. And um, that's why that spike in other synthetic opioids, which really means fentanyl for the most part, went up so quickly at that time. Now, in terms of why did during this whole time that that purple line is climbing and climbing and climbing, did doctors think that these prescription opioids were so safe? Well, in part of the, when, when doctors are, when we're reviewing what a good therapy is, we, we look at different literature, and we like literature that has citations. And citations are usually coming from like a peer-reviewed journal or um, like a legitimate study. And you don't usually go, I don't or I never did before, go back and look at each citation and say, where's this actually coming from? What, you know, like, what is this source? You, know, you, you don't assume people are trying to like, trick you or pull the wool over your eyes. So one of the main citations and one that some of these um, companies use to say that prescription opioids were kind of safe and not addictive was this tiny little letter to the editor way back in the back of a New England Journal of Medicine. And it's like a few sentences long, and it basically says something like, we looked at about 12,000 patients. They were getting opioids in the hospital. Very few of them got addicted. And it's pretty much, as a physician and as a clinician, totally useless to me, because they don't tell me what they count as addiction. They don't tell me how much opioids people were taking. They don't tell me, they don't really tell me anything. They're just like, we don't think this is a very addictive substance. You know, it's a very unrigorous. When you evaluate a, um, like a scientific study and we'll look at some later, it almost takes a great deal of training just to be able to interpret and, and read one and 
and decide whether their statistics are valid and whether their methods make sense. This is really not scientific at all. Yet, it went completely viral, like uh, Ice Bucket Challenge of 2014 or Baby Shark that my two and a half year old listens to all the time. And I think what happened was it just became kind of conventional wisdom because people didn't spend enough time kind of looking back and seeing what they were actually citing. So the attending says to the resident, well, you know, there's, there's evidence that uh, these opioids, they're not really addictive. And then the resident says to the medical student, well, everybody knows that, you know, addiction is really, really rare. But this doesn't tell you enough to really know that. And in fact, in 2017, a group of statisticians went back and they found the 1,000 um, articles that had, and, and literature that had cited this little tiny paragraph, and they realized a couple of things. One, it jumped in 1995, which is when OxyContin was um, developed and put on the market. And two, all the dark blue lines there are what they considered affirmational citations of this tiny little article, which means people were saying like, yeah, that makes sense, instead of being like, this is not really good science, and this does not tell us a whole lot about the addiction risk of opioids. And kind of in, um, in, in their conclusion, they said what we really have to do is kind of be thorough and evaluative when we think about citations and we we look at what people are telling us and decide for ourselves whether it makes sense or not. So I'm going to highlight some of the ways that uh, prescription practices have changed since those days in the 90s and 2000s. And um, it, one statistic is that in 2006, we were writing about 72.4 opioid prescriptions for 100 people in one year. And right, that's kind of right in the midst of that big trial we were talking about. So 12 years down or so, we've cut overall prescriptions written by about 20%. And the other thing that I think is encouraging is what those prescriptions are looking like in terms of like the total dose or the total number of pills. And my example of that is, let's say you get like an ACL repair in 2006 and the orthopedic surgeon might have sent you with like 90 10 milligram oxycodone pills. Most people might have like pain for like a week or so after a surgery like that, and some people a little less, some people a little more. But that doctor might have thought, listen, I've been told this doesn't really have much of an addiction risk, and the patient might be in a lot of pain, and this way I don't have to worry about it, and they don't have to worry about it, and it's more convenient for them, and I'll just write three refills on it, and whatever, they can throw out the rest. These days, what would probably happen if, like, you know, you were with an orthopedic surgeon who graduated recently, they might say, well, I'm going to give you 10 5 milligram pills of oxycodone and see how that goes. And the patient might call back and say, I'm doing pretty well. I still have a lot of pain. I'm doing my physical therapy, but man, it's really hard. And then that doctor, she might say, all right, I'm going to write you a prescription for another 10 <coughs> uh, of those pills. But if you're still having pain after that, you have to come in and see me because something might you know, be wrong. I might have to evaluate. So that's twice as many prescriptions, but actually a fraction of the actual dose that was prescribed. And um, when we talk about and that's true because the, the kind of prescription dose decreased from about 59.7 to 45.3. And that's in um, a unit that we call milligram morphine equivalents or morphine milligram equivalents. And if you see that, MME, what they're talking about is the fact that because um, one milligram of uh, morphine might be the same as like 0.7 milligrams of hydromorphone or dilaudid or something like that. You want to have a way of talking about the amount of the dose in terms of an equal potency across the different kinds of medicine. So 
Yeah, in a sense, I think that everybody these days who's prescribing opioids is doing a better job of kind of tailoring a treatment plan to a specific patient instead of just kind of writing, sorry, that like the biggest, most convenient script they can. And yet, drug overdose deaths are still going up. So uh, why is that? And here, what, what we see is going up the fastest, that purple line where it says synthetic opioids other than methadone. That's, for our purposes, fentanyl. And I'd say it's probably because uh, during that whole time, that kind of those pur that purple line of uh, overdose deaths was going up. People were getting cont and continuing to get addicted, and we haven't really solved that problem at all. And we're really behind, I think, in um, that segment of treating this problem. And here's some numbers that kind of illustrate that. Uh, in 2016, you had about 12 million people who had reported misusing an opioid, meaning they said, I didn't take, I either took somebody else's opioid, I didn't take it the way that a doctor wanted me to, or I just bought it off the street or something like that. Now, a fraction of a percent of people, 0 0.08, when asked, do you have a problem with opioids? Do you maybe have like an opioid use disorder if you're doing that? Most of them that said no. You know, only a fraction of them said, yeah, I, you know, this is like, I recognize this as problematic opioid use. Look at how this goes with heroin. So in 2016, about a million people used heroin. And like, only two thirds of them were like, yeah, I have a problem with heroin. So that's like 300,000 people here who are using heroin. And like, yeah, but it's, it's fine. Like, it's not a big deal. And I don't, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can, there's a lot of criteria by which you can evaluate for substance use disorder. But in my opinion, if you're using heroin, that's a substance use disorder. And that other one third of people, that 300,000 people just don't have the insight or they're in denial about the fact that they need help. Why is that important to this? Because, so about 40 million people kind of misused drugs altogether uh, in 2016. And only about 2 million people reported that they received any drug addiction treatment. But, which seems like a very low percent of 40 million, right? 2 million, but it's actually worse than that because I think, because this is people that had reported that they got any drug treatment in any facility, including places like an emergency room or a self-help group. And um, no disrespect to my colleagues who work in the emergency room, but anybody who's worked in the, who's been in the emergency room lately knows that that's probably not really the best environment to get substance abuse treatment. We actually have like, a pretty forward-thinking emergency department here where they do begin substance abuse treatment plans for people, but that's not the case most places. And um, I, I think that the same is true of a, like a self-help group. It turns out only about 1.4 million people of those 40 millions actually got substance abuse treatment in what you'd consider like a real specialty, specialty facility for substance abuse. Um, so like an inpatient rehabilitation facility. But, so 1.4 out of 40 million seems really bad, right? And I think it's actually worse than that. And this is kind of an editorial, um, but at a lot of those, even at the specialty facilities uh, for substance abuse treatment, for one thing, a lot of times insurance companies only pay for a few months of substance abuse treatment, and the thinking these days among addiction specialists is you might need like up to six months. So it's hard enough to do that even if insurance is paying for it. Um, but that, that's, you're probably, the people that can do that are probably paying out of pocket a lot of the time. And even at these specialized substance abuse 
facilities, a lot of them can't access Suboxone. And Suboxone is basically the gold standard for opioid use disorder treatment. The relapse rate for heroin is something like 90%. And you can decrease that to like 50% with Suboxone, which in terms of an effect is basically a miracle drug. But because access to it is difficult or they can't get a doctor there or it's kind of like against their philosophy of how they run their treatment center, uh, it's, it's, in my opinion, kind of like woefully underutilized. So that's kind of my overall thinking on why, despite the fact that prescriptions seem to be more in check and we're a little more, um, we're using a little more stewardship over opioids, we need to really work on addiction treatment side of things if we wanna um, stop overdose deaths. Moving on to cannabis, so the quick science slide about cannabis is that cannabis has cannabinoids, and cannabinoids are basically like those neurotransmitters that I showed in the earlier slide, except that they work on um, cannabinoid receptors rather than opioid receptors. And the two that we know most about are the THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, which I'll just call CHC, because that, that's a pretty big word for me. And um, that's the component that's psychoactive and CBD, which is not psychoactive, and we think mitigates some of the psychoactive effects of the THC, and it also works pretty well as an anti-emetic and anti-inflammatory. <clears throat> Where are these receptors? Well, the CB1 receptor is mostly in the central nervous system, <clears throat> which makes sense, right, because it's the mediator of the psychoactive effects. It inhibits release of GABA and some other neurotransmitters, but Interestingly, GABA is a neurotransmitter that tends to make you relaxed and calm, and it inhibits that. And glutamate and glycine are neurotransmitters that tend to sensitize nerves and make you feel more pain. So you can see just by that kind of litany of neurotransmitters it works on, it can do a lot of different things at the same time, right? It can reduce the um, pathways that might make you feel calm, which might lead to anxiety, which we'll talk about a little bit, and it can even amplify some of the neurotransmitters that cause pain, but that doesn't always match up with its clinical effects, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the CB1 receptor is that it actually inhibits GI activity, which you often think about cannabis as like making people eat more, and in fact, that's one of the that's one of its treatment applications for people of chemotherapy-induced nausea and stuff. Um, but it releases a neurotransmitter in the brain that makes that kind of like increases your appetite via your brain. And um, I don't know why I wrote overeating. I shouldn't have written overeating. It induces you to want to eat, which if you have cancer and chemotherapy and you're dangerously underweight, then you're not overeating. You're probably eating appropriately. If you use a lot of cannabis, like after you just ate something and then you eat a lot more, well then I guess it does. But my point is that um, it just induce, it induces eating and it increases dopamine release while you're eating, so it basically makes eating more fun. Then you have the CB2 receptors. These are mostly in the periphery. They're kind of interesting because when folks were looking at cannabis as a treatment for cocaine addiction, this seemed to be the receptor that mediated that. And uh, we're kind of in the really, really basic science phases, not really with a clinical application of seeing that this uh, seems to reduce the inflammatory activity in people that have like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So we know that uh, cannabis has the potential to do some good in kind of different health issues. What does it do for my pain patients? So this is one of the earlier systematic reviews of all the decent studies that were done up to 2009, studies trying cannabis for chronic pain. And the authors examined 18 randomized controlled trials and completely the opposite type of study that was kind of that back of the napkin, letter to the editor, few sentence, little blurb that we talked about previously. They made sure that they were really looking at trials that where the methodology was really rigorous, 
the statistics could really be backed up mathematically. And uh, it could actually tell you something that you could believe. The majority of the studies that they looked at were comparing cannabis to placebo. So we prefer studies where we're preferring one therapy to another therapy. But if, that, if they really can make a subject blind to the fact that they're getting the placebo versus the treatment, that's good too. And what they found was that <coughs> the group who actually got real cannabis um, reported lower pain than the group that got the placebo with an effect size of 0 0.61. And just to explain effect size a little bit when you're reading a study, what it means is the cannabis group had a, if they asked them what their pain was after they, after they used the cannabis, that group, it was 0 0.61 standard deviations below the other group. And we usually think of 0 0.5 as like a medium effect size and 0 0.8 as a large effect size. So that's like um, in between medium and good effect size. The concerning thing was um, the side effects. And that's well demonstrated, I think, by the statistic number needed to harm. Number needed to harm basically means how many people do you have to give that treatment to so that they get an effect that you weren't expecting them to get. So the number needed to harm for euphoria is eight. And euphoria, I guess you're not harming anybody. I like euphoria. But it's not what you were planning on getting with, the, you know, with your result. And dysphoria is 29, which is really good. You, you have to give this treatment to 29 people before one of them gets dysphoric. On the other hand, there's these other domains like alterations and perceptions, which goes all the way from kind of confusion to acute psychosis. And this is where you have to be careful where you're reading a study, because acute psychosis is like a really specific disease entity. It's when your, um, I'd say, signal processing is so dysregulated that you're actually perceiving stimuli from your environment that aren't there. So it's a really kind of major debilitating thing. And it's hard for me to, I know a lot of people that use a lot of cannabis, and it's hard for me to believe that like for every seven of them, somebody goes acutely psychotic. If that were the case, our emergency department would be flooded with people with psychosis. Con but it's kind of lumped in there. So you kind of have to use your judgment, and you have to be careful about what that really means. Same with ataxia. Ataxia, if I put somebody's ataxic in a doctor's note, it means they're so uncoordinated that they can't even ambulate. Like, they, they can't walk around. So, and that's just kind of lumped in there with numbness. So when you see how frequent these side effects are, it's concerning, but it doesn't necessarily mean, it might not, if you think about it critically, it might not be as bad as it kind of looks on paper. Now, it's still concerning. I mean, concerning the, that side effect profile would prevent another medicine from getting approved by the FDA, for sure. So another interesting study, um, this group in New York City was having patients with chronic pain use inhaled cannabis. And they found it didn't really do a lot for most people, but it seemed to do the best for people who had neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is a kind of pain that like, has a really specific set of symptoms, and it's usually from like a nerve being injured. And they found that, indeed, the patients who had neuropathic pain who used inhaled cannabis with a number needed to treat of 5.6 which is the opposite of number needed to harm, meaning 5.6 people you gave it to, one of them would actually have like a significant improvement. It actually helped. The problem with this uh, group of studies that they looked at from my standpoint, and they recognized this in the study itself, is that the follow-up here is two weeks. So chronic pain is chronic, and uh, two weeks is, did it go further than that? And you, you don't know because you didn't follow up. You don't know what you don't know. So it doesn't help us a lot in knowing whether it's like a good therapy for chronic neuropathic pain. Certainly encouraging. Um, and they also found, of course, that there is a ceiling effect. So the, this is inhaled cannabis. So the more and more and more cannabis you smoke, eventually it doesn't matter if it's making you feel better or not because you're just going to be so high you're not going to be functional. <coughs> 
um, multiple sclerosis, if you lived in the UK or uh, Canada or Europe, you might be prescribed a medicine called nabiximol for, um, for MS-induced spasticity. And uh, nabiximol is like 50% THC and 50% CBD. And this study looked at 630 people uh, who got some can like whole plant cannabis extract versus just the THC versus a placebo. And spasticity is an objective measurement. It's different than pain because I can put your leg in a machine that will tell me how much it moves and how much it doesn't. And that they found cannabis really had no effect on. But there's also a way that you can kind of objectively measure how mobile someone is, how well they can walk, how fast they can get from here to there, and how basically well they can do things. Um, and in that domain, things were improved in the group that used cannabis. Uh, and we don't know if it's because they just felt better, so they could move a little bit better, or, or what it was. And they did find that after that improvement seemed to go away after a period of time. Um, and they didn't really record a lot of side effects, but again, kind of some interesting information there that sparked some other research that uh, you know is promising. Now, that's just kind of a smattering of different studies that basically I've read recently, but that's like a tiny sliver of all the different uh, studies and analyses and literature that people have compiled on cannabis. And as you can imagine, no one doctor or scientist probably has enough time to like go through everything and say, well, I think I know what the story is with cannabis. So the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine, which used to be called the Institute of Medicine, was commissioned to basically, as a group, figure out everything we could possibly find out like that seems well validated, that seems backed up, that seems provable about cannabis as a therapy just across medicine, not just for pain. And it's like uh, 600, 700 pages. Um, but they found some kind of recurrent themes time after time that they said, I think we can really hang our hat on these particular notes. One of them is that if you have nausea and vomiting, from chemotherapy and cancer, this, these compounds are effective. Two is if you have chronic pain, you're more likely to report subjectively an improvement in symptoms with these compounds. Three is if you have multiple sclerosis, at least in the short term, you should get improvement in some of your spasticity symptoms, how you feel like your spasticity is doing. Even if I hook you up to a machine that measures the spasticity of your muscles, and I don't see a difference. And in all of those domains, improvements are, eh, they're okay. Nothing earth shattering, nothing groundbreaking, nothing life changing, but you know, sometimes for people without other options, a little bit is really significant. What are some of the known drawbacks that we can say for sure? More frequent chronic bronchitis episodes. Makes sense, you're talking about inhaled hot, irritative chemicals, right? Um, but then there's some other things that are surprising, like if you just use cannabis once, there's certain respiratory mechanics that you can measure that might be improved. They don't stick around if you use it chronically, but it's kind of like, oh, who would have thought? What can we, how can we take that to learn something useful about this compound, right? Um, if you smoke cannabis for a while and then you stop and you had some respiratory symptoms like asthma or coughing or bronchitis before, it should get better. Nothing really surprising there. Here's what really blows my mind. I spent years telling all my patients who smoked cannabis that they should stop because it's going to give them cancer. But after looking at all the data, it doesn't look like we can really say that. And this is where your faith in science has to be really, really strong because all of my common sense tells me that if you smoke cannabis, you've got to be increasing your risk for lung cancer and head and neck cancer. But we cannot say that with the data that we have right now. And 
when I am faced with one of these quandaries, I just think back to all of the doctors who told their patients that there was so little chance they could get addicted to uh, opioids. And that's what they knew at the time. And the fact that we used to tell pregnant women that they should smoke while they were pregnant because the, ob the obstetricians were afraid that they'd get fat and then they'd have a hard time delivering the baby. So they said, you should just smoke because it's going to make things safer for everybody. That was conventional wisdom. That's just kind of like what we thought and we were wrong. So when I see, so those are kind of the things I think of that help me say, okay, this is the evidence we have. This is what I'll go with for right now. I'm skeptical that this won't be disproved at some point. Um, but that's kind of what relying on science means. We do know that if you use cannabis and then drive, you drive worse. And there's some um, data about motor vehicle accidents in states where there's cannabis is legal. And I can, um, I can explain to you kind of the difference between that data. Um, and of course, if there's a lot of cannabis around in the form of like a cookie or a brownie, there's more likely that like a young kid would consume that. Where risks really start getting known and clear is with mental health. And this is uh, very similar to what we learn about kind of alcohol and young people. Um, if you took a cognitive performance test after you used cannabis, you'd probably do worse. And um, there's some studies that show for people that uh, have used cannabis for a long time, they might perform worse over the long term on those cognitive tests than people who haven't. But what's really concerning and we really have to take seriously is the fact that use during adolescence seems to be associated with impairments in people's ability to achieve academically, later on in their employment and income, and even kind of in their social functioning. So not many people are advocating for cannabis use in adolescence, but it's really important to be aware of um, the fact that that's kind of like a whole different ball game. And we're not usually, in the studies where we've looked at cannabis for other things like chronic pain and MS and chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, that was not with adolescents. And as you can imagine, if you use a substance a lot more, whether cannabis or anything else, you're more likely to develop a problematic relationship with that substance, right? And if you start at a younger age, you're more likely to grow into maybe a more problematic relationship with cannabis, same as with alcohol. And we do know pretty well that, uh, that the strong association between cannabis and psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, and the way we think that that's the case is that there's certain people who are uh, more prone either genetically or epigenetically to get schizophrenia, and you might s accelerate that or make that risk factor uh, even more strong in them. Now, you have to take that kind of in the whole clinical picture, too, because usually if people don't get, don't kind of present symptoms of schizophrenia by 45, my, my wife's here. She's, she's even helping me with my lecture right now. <laughs> she helps me with everything. So if you don't have symptoms by 45, like you're probably not going to get schizophrenia. So that's like a little bit of a different risk factor to consider in terms of its likelihood of causing psychosis or schizophrenia. Strangely, people have found, and I don't know under the context that people were finding this, but people who have schizophrenia or psychosis seem to maybe learn or remember better when they're using, like, with cannabis. I don't really know the application of that yet. Um, it seems like if you're using cannabis almost every day, you're probably um, increasing the risk of worsening bipolar disorder symptoms. And this slide has a little bit of um, conflict on it because it says, cannabis does not appear to increase the likelihood of developing depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Right down below, though, heavy cannabis users are more likely to report thoughts of suicide than non-users and regular cannabis use is likely to increase the risk for developing social anxiety. So I have 
um, I've tried to unpack this literature as best I could, and I've tried to get in touch with some of the different authors who put this together. And I've yet really to figure out how the um, contradiction and how to interpret the contradiction between something that doesn't really increase the likelihood of depression, but if you're using it a lot, you're more likely to think about suicide, and same with anxiety disorder. And the only thing I can think of is there's different ways of looking at associations, and you can imagine a scenario where if somebody is depressed to the point of being suicidal and they're using substances like cannabis to cope, that's different than using cannabis and seeing if that actually turns into a depressive disorder. There's different ways of kind of considering associations between different variables. But I don't know the answer to that. And uh, I think it kind of points to the lack of clarity there. I just have a few more things to talk about. Um, so I think that demonstrates that there's kind of potential pain applications for cannabis that with side effects we really have to take seriously. Here are some um, studies that kind of ended up in the popular press, I think, that people drew a lot of conclusions about, and they're really open-ended. So I thought it would be a good way to end because it'll kind of allow you to decide for yourself and see how um, unclear it can be in terms of drawing a conclusion from a study and how careful you have to be. In 2014, JAMA published a study showing that states that had medical cannabis available um, this is 99 through 2010. There were 13 of them. Vermont was one. On average, there were 25% fewer overdose deaths annually. That excluded intentional overdose, but it included heroin. And that's really interesting. So the extrapolation that I form in my mind is, are people using recreational cannabis instead of opioids? And therefore, because it's less likely to kill you, they're dying less. Or two, are people in less pain because cannabis is available, so they're not using as many prescription opioids and not having as many unintentional overdoses. We don't know. You can't know something like that from that kind of sliver of information, but it really it makes you want to find out. Then uh, in 2016, um, in kind of like a public health journal, some folks were looking at states where medical marijuana was available. This is between 2010 and 2013. And they chose some conditions that they thought people might use medical cannabis for. Anxiety, depression, glaucoma, nausea, pain, psychosis, seizures, sleep disorder, spasticity. And they got these by looking at meta-analyses of people evaluating the effectiveness of cannabis for these conditions. And they didn't care whether cannabis was effective or not for these conditions. In fact, as you can see, most of the literature they found it was not effective, but it gave them an idea of what people are trying to treat with cannabis. Then they said, all right, what is the rate of prescription medicines like for people with those conditions in those states where cannabis is uh, accessible? So basically, how many antidepressants were prescribed to people with depression in a state with cannabis available versus not available, right? And they found indeed in pretty much all domains where there was cannabis available, there were fewer medicines prescribed. Now there's no health outcomes here. For all we know, those people could have died sooner and more easily in those states. We just know fewer medicines were prescribed. And what they were actually looking with is how much does that cost? So the headline might be something like cannabis reduces prescription medications or is a great treatment for anxiety or something like that. That's not what this says. It seems to be cheaper to insure a Medicare patient in those states, but that's kind of as far as you can go. Um, and then most recently, the study in JAMA looked at kind of just opioid prescriptions. Again, not outcomes, not overdoses, just uh, how much opioids were prescribed. And this time it's up to 2016, so there's actually some states where just recreational cannabis is available. And opioid prescribing rates are indeed lower. Now I'd say you don't know whether patients in those states have less chronic pain. You don't know if there's like more, um, there's less restrictions on kind of like prescribing and pill mills. You, you don't know. 
Um, but you can kind of see how a study with that finding can get kind of thrown into a newspaper or something and make it seem one way or the other. But I'll let, I'll let you kind of think about that and decide whether you think it's meaningful or not. So this is all the stuff you can tell that relative who's like berating you or, your, or another physician at, at Thanksgiving or whatever holiday you, you're celebrating. Um, why can't we just give you a straight answer on whether cannabis is a good therapy or not, besides the fact that there's no kind of perfect therapies, especially for these conditions? Well, it's still a Schedule One controlled substance. And what that means is back in the Nixon administration, it was deemed to have a high abuse potential, could lead to severe dependence, and there was no acceptable acceptable medical use for it, even though we use it for medical applications now. And compare that down here at Schedule 4 to something like Xanax, which it says it has a moderate abuse potential and may lead to limited uh, dependence. Like Xanax is now one of the most abused medications out there. And in fact, it's so addictive that if you take a lot of it, for a long time, and you stop it right away, you can seize and die. So it's like, it, the, just the whole uh, scheduling is kind of completely off base of what we know about medicines now. So that's really a hindrance for most clinicians and scientists think for trying to find the most benefit out of, out of these compounds. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention one thing um, for the question and answer period. Uh, substance use disorder, chronic pain, a lot of people have very personal stories about these issues. And uh, I just ask that for questions, please keep your questions. I'm sure you have questions about kind of your own treatment. Just please keep your questions general enough so it kind of applies to the talk and to the group because um, Obviously, I can't really give medical advice. It's inappropriate to do so in this environment. So um, the best way to get the best answer from me is just to keep like uh, your questions kind of um, general and hypothetical if necessary. I guess so. OK. Um, uh, so one of the slides it showed fentanyl and then tramadol also in the same. So I. I'm a nurse, and I had heard over time that tramadol is just not as strong a medication um, such, as, such as an opioid. Right. What's, what's? Yeah, what's the deal with that? Yeah. So I'll just go back really quickly to what you're talking about here. So overdose deaths of synthetic opioids other than methadone, which could mean tramadol, these deaths, we just know from autopsy reports, are not tramadol, they're fentanyl. The reason that they're kind of lumped into the same category is because the way that those molecules are made uh, is similar to one another. So uh, tramadol is kind of like a completely different animal in terms of its safety, how much it decreases respiration, how potent it is. But chemically, in terms of the shape of them and how they're made, they kind of fall into the same class. So this slide is more, it probably would have been more useful for them to say, like, put street drugs in one category or something like that. But they, they just happen to organize it in terms of more the chemical structure of the drug. And so is, is tramadol as, as um, addictive? No. Because it's it's not as uh, it's not as potent, it's not as short acting, and as rapid onset. I want one more question. Um, so when I started practicing, um, most everybody would get Tylenol number three, which is Tylenol with what thirty milligrams of codeine, mm -hmm. and I don't remember people dying from that, and and it doesn't seem like that's being. Um, subscribe that much on anymore. So the question is, there used to be a 
compound called Tylenol number no. 3, which had some codeine in it, which is a weak opioid. Why don't we use that anymore? The reason we don't use it anymore is because people actually did die from it, but not in the same way as they're dying from other opioids. The codeine has to get metabolized by your internal organs to, um, to morphine, actually. And some people could metabolize it all at once, and they'd get a huge spike of morphine in their blood, which would make them stop breathing, and they could die, especially kids. And other people, just based on kind of their body chemistry, would barely metabolize it at all, and not much of it would turn into the morphine. So it was very variable in terms of the effect that it had. So that's kind of why it, it fell out of favor. Hi. Um, so I would like to ask two questions, relatively not related. Um, the first is about cannabis. Um, also, hi, I'm right here. I can't see you. Thanks. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, so when you um, mentioned that cannabis apparently does not cause cancer, my follow-up is, is that due to a like, dearth of research because it's still scheduled as a class one, or is it because you do have enough data that you feel comfortable saying that? It's, it's probably a little bit of a dearth of research influencing people to say, well, the research we do have doesn't show an association. Got it. Okay. Um, my second question is about gabapentin and scheduling. I work in pharmacy, sorry. Um, what are your Mr. thoughts on gabapentin slowly becoming theoretically a Schedule Five medication? Let me look back at Schedule Five. <laughs> And I'll tell Fair. Um, well, and I don't know the data on it. I'd say there's a very, very limited dependence potential, at least in my patients. Um, there's always an abuse potential for anything that can change your sensorium a little bit, in my opinion. Where do I see people abusing gabapentin? In prisons? and in conditions where life is kind of so bad that even just kind of not noticing quite as much is preferred. So there is, there's always kind of a very limited abuse potential in anything that can just kind of make you out of it to some extent. But I think probably in the general population that's low. I'd have to also know how that would really kind of affect availability for it. It's already like, you know, you already need a prescription. Um, would it be harder? Would you have to do monitoring with it, that kind of stuff? I, I'd have to see more information to see whether that would keep people safer or not. OK, so I had a question. Um, I had a, a couple of procedures uh, recently, and I was surprised that um, there's supply and access to fentanyl. And I just wanted to know, one, how does the hospital get the supply and how do folks know it's pure? And then um, I was wondering about the history and the study of that because it's pretty lethal. Um, and I just had to trust the anesthesiologist, that, you know, like, okay, here we go. Right. But it's pretty lethal. It's particularly lethal. So the question is, uh, we use fentanyl a lot in the hospital. Is that safe? Are we crazy? Sorry to paraphrase you a little bit. Um, but that's a, what my patients tell me a lot when they say, what are you going to use for this anesthesia? And I'm like, well, we'll use a, a little fentanyl. And you hear so many terrible things about fentanyl. But it's like many things in that it's just a tool. It's not, it doesn't kind of have an implicit goodness or badness. It really depends upon the hands of the person that's using it. It's incredibly lethal on the street. And the product that is sold on the street is produced in who knows where, under who knows what conditions. The product that we get in the hospital is produced under sterile conditions by uh, facilities that are uh, heavily regulated in terms of their safety, sterility, um, like chemical validity of the compound itself. And you, the important thing is that only people who really understand very, very specifically the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of these medications and how people are going to respond to them should be giving them. But uh, we, 
you know, we have drug shortages a lot, and we can't give a lot of the drugs that we want to give because there's problems with production. And a lot of that's because the production of our drugs is so strict. So I think I can reassure you all that the medicines that you're getting in the hospital almost only always are um, very safe, and the people that should be given them are accredited and have passed a lot of tests and have demonstrated themselves to be safe with them. I think somebody else is passing the mic. Hi, sir, up in the back here. Yes, I had a question on, could you elaborate more on the scale of one, a zero to 10 and how it seems like a very odd thing in science to have this arbitrary scale that is independent. Uh, every person has their own scale. How much of the problem is related to that scale? So the question is, uh, how do we make objective decisions based on a zero to 10 pain scale that's going to be different for everybody? If I got punched in the face and Mike Tyson got punched in the face. He's been punched in the face a gajillion times and he'll probably be like, that was a one out of 10 pain and I'd probably say that was a 10 out of 10 pain and it really depends on everybody's kind of tolerance to pain. And indeed, it creates an incredibly um, difficult problem in terms of uh, how to treat and what to do about it. Um, pain complaints amongst different patients. What we try to do, and, and I didn't really have time to point this out, but it's really what we're always looking for, kind of the unicorn in pain studies, is something where they don't just use a pain scale of 0 to 10, because like you're saying, it's very subjective. A great thing, if you can find it, is if somebody can measure maybe a dose of opioids that somebody took before a therapy and see if it went down or decreased at all after they took that therapy because that should that's actually um, a number that's a dose that's somewhat more objective but that's a lot more complicated to design and perform but um, indeed it was a, I'd say a big contributing factor to uh, probably inappropriately flooding the healthcare landscape with opioids, you know, in my practice, I commonly see people who say, you know, you do something for, and their pain goes from a nine to an eight, and you say, I'm really sorry that that's as far as I got, and they say, are you kidding me? Thank you so much. An eight is fantastic to where I've been. At an eight, at least I can garden a little, or something like that. So the other thing that we really should be thinking about more instead of just a number, is what are you doing and what are the goals that you're able to accomplish with the uh, level of pain and disability that you have? And that's a lot more meaningful to people than kind of a zero to 10 thing. Hi, sir. I just want to say you have a very good presentation style, so I appreciate that. I think you're doing great. Thanks. So keep it up to you and your wife. <laughs> Excuse my, uh, my uh, pharmacology here, but uh, if I understand correctly, so CB1 inhibits GABA, which therefore increases dopamine, much like the mu opioid inhibits GABA, therefore increases dopamine. So my question is, as far as in your own experiences or your own lit reviews, is if there is any type of, say, relationship between CB1 and mu to where if someone is a cannabis user and then is exposed to opiates later on, if that mu opioid receptor is, let's say, primed, for lack of a better word, where perhaps physical addiction might be more uh, susceptible than someone who's not a cannabis user, if, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and your your knowledge and of the pharmacology and the neurotransmitters is probably beyond a little bit what I've prepared for. So, fascinating question. I probably won't be able to answer it to your satisfaction, but I don't know of any. So, in terms of the, um, you're saying a CB1 receptor somehow modulated via GABA to change the properties of a mu receptor, basically? Right. Well, I can imagine a scenario where if you have more circulating GABA, you'd think usually that's more of a potentiator of a mu receptor. 
at least in terms of the pharmacology that we deal with with a lot of our anesthetic drugs. But then again, when you have a lot of potentiation over and over again, you can kind of have a negative feedback inhibition. So I can indeed imagine it working the opposite way and you know, perhaps um, negating some of those effects at mu. But you know, I think what, you're, what your question speaks to is how can we use these pathways together to you know, better modulate pain with maybe less side effects on both ends? And that's, uh, that's a strategy that we use all the time in pharmacology, and I think uh, it's a great idea, and it's certainly an excellent direction for research to go in. And so, and just real quick as a follow-up, um, not making this about public policy, but being the subject matter expert in the front of the room here, is there a concern about... about that. Somebody who's read a lot of stuff. I, that's probably as far as I'd go. And you're a sharp dresser, so you've got two things going for you. But the, um, in, a, in, a, in a state, in a country that's dealing with the opiate crisis, right, as far as if there is any concern about uh, cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoids in our central nervous system and then uh, opioid exposure later on to where uh, one, say, precipitates the other by way of, say, that, again, that, say, physiological addiction. Mm -hmm. So... So if I understand correctly, you're saying, can we per kind of prime somebody for um, like physiological addiction by using two compounds together rather than one? I don't know the answer to that, you know, because we've seen that you can decrease um, addiction symptoms to cocaine with cannabinoids. So I'd have to think about how you could design some kind of study to see whether together they potentiated risk for addiction or they could, one could be like almost like a treatment for the other. So basically I don't know, but good thoughts. Um, is there a genetic predis predisposition for developing an opioid dependence? Yeah, there's, um, and I'm not an addiction specialist, but pretty much throughout addiction we see um, both kind of like a biochemical predisposition, and then there's kind of the social and environmental predisposition too, right? So if you grow up in a home with alcoholic parents, that's kind of what you see, and so socially you might be more primed to do that, but you can also do uh, physiological imaging studies and looking at chemicals in the blood where certain lineages of people may be more predisposed to addiction. And that's not just opioids. I, I have two questions. The first one, in your slide under Schedule 3, um, you, you say that um, the combination of opiates and non-narcotic drugs are le may lead to moderate dependence. Do you think everyone, if they're on narcotics long enough, will become dependent? I mean, the, the whole opiate crisis seems to be based on that. The question is, if, you, if any person is on uh, like an opioid long enough, will they become dependent in some way? And I'd say to some extent, yes, because you're nervous system and your nerves are changing morphologically how they respond to different stimuli and um, because they're used to a certain amount of those compounds in your body. And pretty much, even if it's very, very mild, you usually see for somebody who's been on even a small amount of opiates for a long time, some symptoms when they change that dose or decrease it. Like what? Um, usually it's just kind of uh, either not feeling really good, kind of what we call malaise, just kind of feeling bad. Um, and some people feel really antsy and anxious and some people have like uh, where their like hot cold sensation is off. It really depends from person to person. Okay. And my, my second question is, no one seems to make any um, differentiation when they talk about the opiate crisis, and I use quotation marks on that, 
uh, between people who take opiates from, for cr uh, chronic pain and people who take it because they like, because they may have started at age 12 or 14 and they like the feeling they get from smoking pot, from doing, you know, they like that drowsy, druggy feeling or they like the high that they may get or they like, there's something about it that they like. Um, and usually if they, if they take something that doesn't act the way they want it to, then they switch to a different drug. So, th so what they're overdosing on is street drugs. I'm sorry, what, and you're asking? But what, well, what, I, I never hear, when they talk about the, the um, statistics for overdose deaths, I never hear anybody differentiate between those two, two types of people. I mean, they do exist, don't they? They do, and that's what some of these um, lines back here show. And uh, I can I see what you mean in terms of kind of this sweeping language of opioid overdose deaths. Uh, a lot of times they're talked about kind of as one bigger thing. But um, here you can see that the light blue line is people who are dying by prescription opioids. And the, and the orange line is heroin, and the purple line is probably fentanyl. So as clinicians and people who are interested in addiction and reducing the amount of opioid deaths, we care a great deal about how that, how, how that happens because to prevent them is, you know, like totally different avenues. So I have a couple of questions. Um, I guess one of my questions is around um, this idea that states um, that had medical marijuana had lower opioid prescriptions. Um, so one thing that concerns me is I think that study was repeated exactly by some researchers in Stanford within the last 12 months or so. Mm -hmm or they're published within the last, and they found exactly the opposite mm. findings. I think it's important that we uh, consider that. Uh, the other thing is um, a little bit about this gentleman's question. Um, there is some evidence, um, there's a very good quality controlled study that looked at people who you know, had taken marijuana. They were almost, I believe, close to three times as likely to um, develop opioid dis disorder. So there is some good studies out there that do show that you know, marijuana use um, predisposes you to addiction, and I think there's neurobiology that, that backs that idea up. Um, and then lastly, I think it's important, um, I mean, when you look at the overdose deaths in a place like Colorado that has lots of marijuana available, um, you know, legal and illegal, whatever, um, their overdose deaths have increased every single year. So last year was the highest, you know, year. Um, um, it, it just keeps on going up. So it, it doesn't look like this is a, a great um, anecdote, antidote, sorry, for um, our epidemic, tragically. Yeah, I, I agree with, I mean, that. thank you for bringing all that information. Uh, I think that's you know, very well taken. Um, th and that's kind of the problem with taking like little bit, little slices of information. And I, you know, I hope that I, I hope that I conveyed that it's really difficult to kind of draw conclusions about how these compounds should be used and considered you For know, sure. with, yep. with the amount of information we have. Thanks. So I appreciate, I think I'm over here. I appreciate the, um, you're mentioning Schedule One and the limitations that it has, um, especially on research. Can you raise your hand? I just can't. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, and the piece, I know we're running out of time, the piece that I'm really curious about, because I've read there's, especially on the medical cannabis side, as opposed to, uh, you know, recreational abuse, on the medical side, how uh, much more advanced other countries have been with medical cannabis because they haven't been re as restricted as we are in the United States. So Israel, for instance, is one of the leading countries. Israel, I think, was actually the scientists there that first found it to be you know, potentially useful and were able to first um, 
extract THC and CBD mm -hmm. like in, independently. Yeah. But you're, you're asking whether I think that the science is more, or the therapeutic options are kind of more divert wide there? Well, I, I, I think from what I've read that in countries where we, there, there's not this political restriction, because we know that there are some therapeutic applications for cannabis, um, and we know that a lot of the restrictions that came decades and decades ago were political and not necessarily science-oriented or research-oriented, and so we're right, seeing that in, the, in these other countries. So. Duly noted. Yep. Hi, thank you for this talk. I really appreciate it. I'm a sufferer of chronic pain. Um, my question is, how are there opportunities out there for primary care providers to become more educated on uh, the potential effectiveness of mar medical marijuana? I think uh, finally there are. The question is, what um, what kind of educational options are available for clinicians to figure out how to use uh, cannabis compounds the best way for chronic pain patients? And I think more and more there's a decently evidence-based kind of um, lectures that people can go to, webinars that people can watch on their lunch break. And as doctors, we have to get, um, we have to demonstrate that we've done continuing medical education. So you have to get a certain amount of credits per year that show I'm actually trying to continue to learn stuff and I'm staying up to date. And so a lot of people more and more, I think will be looking at those, um, educational materials as part of their continuing medical education because the patients have a lot of questions about this. And it's not something we're taught in medical school. Well, these folks up here might. They really know their stuff. But So we have time for one more question. We're going to take it back here. Hi. Um, in, in, along those lines, I'm really interested in where the future of pain management is heading. Is there anything that's being developed or researched that seems really promising, that seems like, you know, you guys are excited about, there's like a direction, there's less addiction, there's, you know, more pain management options? The question is kind of where are we going in terms of, um, I'd say medical options for chronic pain treatments. And I think we're going in two directions here. One is the direction of finding kind of um, chemical ways where we can interrupt these sensitization pathways from happening. And that's a lot of basic science research that takes a lot of time. There's a lot of test tubes and animal studies and, um, and expense. And, and then there's the other side of things where we're kind of coming out of a period where, like I said, pain was supposed to be zero out of 10 at all times. And I think there's another kind of um, direction that people are thinking about in terms of therapy that's kind of getting away from a lot of treatment and kind of using different internal coping mechanisms and kind of like different maybe ways of considering our bodies and what they're telling us to basically think about how we should be considering pain and interacting with it. So they're both uh, pretty interesting, um, but completely divergent in terms of kind of how you study them and how you look at them. Thank you for attending Community Medical School tonight. Can we give Dr. Wolf a hand for presenting? And our next presentation is on November 12th. It will be in um, Sullivan Classroom, um, which is just down the hall from here. <laughs>